Wow. Um, so thanks so much. It's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I always, uh, four tips. I think there's one behind. Oh, it's, it's on auto. OK. So let's try to go back. Yeah, so it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, you know, every time I come here, I feel like I learn so much. And I'm, I'm really honored to be here, because I'm probably the worst R programmer in the entire room. You know, I thought about what would be useful for people in this room. Um, and I wanted to present something. So I wanted to present something about what would be useful for me. So I thought about the people who maybe you work at organizations in this area. And, um, and I thought about back when I was doing my PhD, and I worked for the World Bank here. And I thought about you know, what we were trying to do at the World Bank. And I wanted to translate some of the things that we learned there. But I also wanted to tell about some of my research. So you, know, you can think about this as how to start a, this is a very like, sexy title. I wanted to get you in the room. But really, <laughs> I'm just going to tell you a bit about my research and also give you some tips on uh, doing machine learning projects that can scale within an organization. Uh, and just by way of introduction, I'm an assistant professor of management science and economics at Chapman University. If you've seen the TV show The OC, that is like not too far from like the student population that we have there. Um, and I, you know, I feel like so. So I, I always want to talk at my university because it has a really great reputation on the West Coast. So we get a choice of California undergrads. But you know, these are kids coming in off of like with surfboards and skateboards. And I can say that we've had explosive growth within interest in machine learning. So I teach uh, machine learning courses to undergrads and MBAs. And we've had nearly 100% year-over-year growth. So now we teach four sections a semester of, of machine learning. We're opening up and expanding. Kind of every business school is doing this, like trying to expand into more analytics classes. So it's a great place to be if you're interested. You know, this is just a great time for uh, for machine learning. So the thing I want to talk about is, you know, when you think about machine learning, you often think about these companies on the left. So you think about Facebook, Google. These are so-called digital native companies. So these are companies that kind of from top down, they pretty much have a machine learning or a coding mindset. And you know, you know there's a lot of organizations here. Um, you know, think about the World Bank. Think about um, the Department of Census. Think about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. These are a lot of the organizations that are represented maybe in this room. And you pretty much can't expect that people top down have a digital native mindset, right? And yet, we're often the people in those rooms. Maybe we're the guy or the girl who's trying to implement these solutions. And anyone who's done this in these organizations realized how tough this is, like incredibly difficult. And yet, if you think of the mission statement for these organizations, like if we can implement some of the machine learning solutions at these organizations, just incredibly powerful. And I would say that the, the low-hanging fruit for what is possible is much greater here than it is over there. No knock if you happen to work over here. You probably make more money if you work over here. <laughs> but like, a lot of the people over here, you know, this is where I think there's a lot of impact that's still left to be made. So, OK. So, but a lot of the conflict comes from this aspect, which is that like, you know, who within an org chart actually understands machine learning? right? So, you pretty much, maybe if you work in like marketing or R&D, you understand R. Um, but how about, you know, to get any project that's going to scale, you're going to have to like somehow communicate what you're doing up, to, up the hierarchy. And so, you know, do the rest of the people understand R? Do they understand machine learning? And how about the people above them, really? Like, there's just like no way this is happening. So, <laughs> and yet the problem is, the problem is that you eventually need to, like, you're, what, you're, what thing you're doing, that transformative project, which everyone in this room has capabilities of making some transformative project, you eventually need to make this its way upwards. And so I, the, 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 the advice I want to give here, I mean, before I talk about my research, I want to talk about how do you scale that thing upwards within an organization. And you know, there's a lot of like, constraints to an organization for implementing these things. And so kind of the first piece of advice I want to give you is, you need to be able to explain how your model works in language, not just how you understand it or how your boss understands it, but how your boss's boss understands it. So you can't just, you can't just throw around buzzwords. You can't just say things like CNN, RNNs. Do we even understand what these mean? But you have to be able to explain them in ways that you're, that, that, you know, they often say like, you know, the grandmother test. Like, like explain this in ways that your grandmother would understand something. And I think that's a little patronizing, but you know, think about this. It's not just about like not using acronyms. It's also about any culture has its own way of doing things and has its own way of explaining things. And so you have to find a way to kind of bridge in that machine learning topic, and you have to explain that using their own own language. So, 
So find out like, how they communicate within an organization. Find out how you can explain that machine learning model. And then communicate with those two. And I think that's really hard, because then you have to understand actually what you're doing. Right? You have to understand it on so many levels, on a mathematical level, a programming level, and also kind of an intuitive level. Um, and that's why you know, I'm going to give a, a shout out to business school students who learn machine learning, because that's one of the things we focus on like, from the get-go. It's not just about, do you understand this mathematically? Do you understand how to program it? But it's really like, how do you communicate within a team? So maybe hire some people from, uh, who have a business school background. So another thing, so let's say like, you're able to communicate. You've got this great memo report. There might be another constraint here. It's like, if you think about it, like, how do these people really get to the top, right? <laughs> and OK, so let's say you're coming in, and you're like the new, you got all the new cool tools, right? So you're coming in there. You, you're, you're all teched out. But think about your boss. Like your boss, your <laughs> boss came in there using the old new tools, right? <laughs> so maybe your boss learned SAS. I mean, think about this. Like your boss SAS? rose rose that org chart about what was popular maybe ten or twenty years ago. So maybe maybe your boss is like was the best SAS programmer there, and he rose to the top. And I'm not even if your boss is interested in learning new things, like there's this natural conflict where it's like something's trying to take food off your plate. You're just going to resist that kind of change. It's a natural human instinct. And so the best quote that I have for this, I think, is by Upton Sinclair. So it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. I, I, like, especially at these organizations which are so risk averse that it's, just, it's really hard to get somebody, especially your boss, when it says, hey, we're going to do this new thing. It does this other thing much better than your old method. That's going to make you obsolete. Like, we're, here, we're here to disrupt you. Like, that's, that's a, you have to have a very, very cautious approach with that. And kind of like, that's why I think like these type of meetups where you're explaining to people of different backgrounds, that helps it out because it's not like, it's not like an exclusive thing. It's like we're inclusive. We're all going to learn this process together, which I think is naturally how most people learn. OK, so, so tip two. I think the way that you actually motivate this is you say, you know, show the current methods and show where they break. Like, explain them, so here's what's lacking with the current methods. Like, I'm, I'm kind of a methods person. Like, I, I think, like, this is a really cool method. We're going to employ this. It's going to be really fun. But if you're the type who, you know, got famous or gotten renowned on the old methods, you're just going to be naturally resistant to the new stuff. And there's a bit of, like, a generational gradient within an organization about who's willing to implement new stuff. So the way that you do this is just, just explain why the current methods are not working. Um, and so, all right, let's try it. All right, so, so in my own work, I often work with satellite images. And I try to use these to fill in what are called data gaps. So data gaps are where we just don't know enough information about certain areas. So um, my dissertation work, I took satellite images. And I, I use um, computer vision technologies. A lot of the stuff that like, we saw earlier with hot dog, not hot dog, I was using pretty much the same models. Um, except I was extracting out buildings, not necessarily hot dogs. Um, and I was using to show how those can be correlated with things like poverty. And why that's so important is because this is how most surveys are, are gathered. So we have to go to somebody's house. We have to interview them for a series of, of hours. And this is incredibly labor intensive, incredibly expensive. And so the way that I, sh I showed at the World Bank that this was broken, um, or at least I didn't, I, I kind of like highlighted this result which is that 57 countries have zero or only one poverty estimate between 2002 and 2011. And so you know, my boss or my boss's boss, they got renowned on the basis of being the best survey methodologist. And that works well in some cases. But clearly, there's a gap. And so the way in which, way in which that gap exists, that's, that invites some new methodologies and some new, new possibilities. All right. so. Another tip here is you need, to be you need to be honest about the limitations of your method. So you want to show where your method does well. You want to show where your method does well. And, but you know, like, don't be honest about these things. Because in the real world, things are never quite as simple as they are on your desktop. So, so I like to show, you know, we're just going to keep watching this. <laughs> OK. So, 
So, I, you know, I, I showed that these satellite imageries, they can be useful for predicting poverty, but I was very cautious about what, it, what are the explanatory power. And it, so it turns out that we can explain somewhere between about 0.4 and 0.7 of predicted poverty using satellite images. Now, that's really good if you have no poverty estimates for, say, the last like 15 or 20 years, but it's obviously not going to replace a really good survey. So, you know, we're very cautious. Like, understand where these new technologies can be useful and where, they, where they're not necessarily going to be useful. Um, all right, but you really don't want to, you know, you want to show the upside potential. You don't want to undersell your own work. Like, it's not the case that you want to say, like, look, look, like, like this stuff is only going to work in certain situations. Like, you want to say, like, what is the potential of this stuff if it really scales, right? Like, that's the incredible thing about these organizations, that they're so big that we, they can, like, start implementing things at scale. And once they do, like, then you have a lot of possibilities. And so you need to show that possibility so that, that person high on the org chart says, like, ah, if I'm the person who grabs a hold of this, then I'm going to get renowned for this, right? right? So you're going to like, spark their imagination about this. Um, so one thing I always like to show, and these, these, this is something I'm experimenting with in my own work, is using these, they have these like, micro satellites by companies like Planet. And so they're about the size of a bread box. They cost about $30,000. And so right now, Planet has more satellites in orbit than any other organization. And in fact, they have somewhere like 200, um, 200 satellites that are constantly scanning the Earth's globe. So we have daily satellite images of all the Earth's land surface. Some of you are nodding your head because you know about this data. So you know, think about like how, but you know, maybe maybe right now, like this is just like a small child. But like, think, imagine what happens when the small when the small child grows up. So I always try to like. You know, show what is what are the capabilities of this. So this is um, this is a uh, we've we've done an image classification over land use, and so this is uh, an image of every road in Mexico trained off of that planet imagery. So if you wanted to, you could capture what are every road in Mexico at the daily rate. So you could see like expansion of roads, expansion, um, you know, at the monthly or some arbitrary frequency. So you just gotta like you know, this is sexy. You gotta sell it. So okay, so. <laughs> So Jared said that he wanted me to do something technical. He's like, you can't just come up here and do a bunch of memes. <laughs> and the problem is that, like, as a researcher, you're, you know, these, these things take a long time. And so like, it was only six months since my last talk. So I'm going to talk about the things that I've done since. Um, and so shifting gears a bit, I'm going to talk about some research where we're trying to answer the question, do internet-enabled mobile phones increase traffic accidents? Um, I let you think about in your own lives, about whether it's like a danger for you or for helping you out. Uh, and this is joint work with Matt and Bree Lang at UC Riverside. And so their working paper we just released is car accidents and 3G coverage, new evidence using cell phone towers. And you can kind of think about how we're weaving in those principles. Even though we're like, now we're like academics in the wild doing whatever we want. Like you can think about how this could be something that you could implement in maybe the Department of Transportation. There's nothing here that we're doing that is different than you, you couldn't do on your own. So. So think about those principles and how we're, how we're weaving those in. All right. So, OK, so, so we're going to look at the growth of 3G technology only within California. We're looking at the growth of cell towers as well as the growth of just internet enabled, like at the road level. So our unit of observation is going to be a road. And we're going to measure between 2001 and 2016. When did that get access to, uh, we're going to measure all the cellular towers. The nice feature is that the government makes any cell tower register. So we have all this rich data on cell towers. And so we're just going to measure, and this is, this is the growth at the road level of which roads get access to, uh, um, to 3G coverage. And this is, like a, this is a great event study, right? Like, if every road is getting access to at different times, you can think that's exogenous to a bunch of other stuff, then we can measure the impact in here. Um, so here's the problem, and this is where machine learning is going to come in, is that we only measure 3G coverage at one time period, in 2016. And, but we know all this other rich data about the closest tower characteristics for these roads between the entire sample. And, the solution here is that we're going to fill in the data gap. So we're going to build a random forest or a machine learning model uh, to predict 3G coverage through this time period. So that's going to tell us we're going to get predicted coverage for 3G access at the road level. And we're going to do this based on like, a rich, uh, rich data set on tower characteristics, like tower elevation, tower height, kind of the elevation around the area, when the tower was built. And of course, we're going to do this in Carrot, because Carrot's a great package for using this stuff. 
Um, shout out to Carrot, shout out to Max. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see how this, as I'll walk you through how we do this. Oh, that was too much. Okay, all right. So the first thing we want to do is once we've loaded our data, we certainly want to cross validate, select our parameters. And the carrot has really nice uh, like sampling features. So this is where we're cross validating over mtry. So that's a number of variables to sample at every split. And it looks like five is the optimal for all these different models. These three different models are different assumptions about the introduction. So when was actually 3G access introduced? Because we don't know that starting date. We have some ideas about, we have reports about when 3G technology was introduced, but it's kind of like staggered introduction. So we either assume that it was introduced in 2003, 2004, or 2005. Um, we pretty much know by 2006 there's 3G access. And uh, you know, the 3G access is a thing that's really going to distract you. That's a thing like you know, having Facebook, all these other things that are uh, going to distract you while you're driving. And it looks like the, uh, the 2005 assumption of the introduction of 3G access is the thing that really um, that, that, that does the best. So, all right. So another thing for us that, that, is, that, that suggests that we should use 2005 as the introduction of 3G access is that if we plot, like in red, we see the random forest prediction for the fraction of roads that have access to 3G. And then we see the, like the fraction of, of like, uh, like mobile broadband subscribers per 100 uh, inhabitants. We see that these two things like match each other really well. So this red is the prediction we get from the random forest. This blue is actual data. They match pretty well. So we know that our predictive, predictive model is doing something real here. All right, so now we're going to do some model calibration. This is something I always like to do with any uh, model that I do. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take all those predicted probabilities that we have. So now we have just from 0 to 1 um, for every road. What's the probability that this road has 3G access at any time period? And we're going to bunch up. We're going to do bins of those predicted probabilities. So the ones between 0 and 0 0.1, 0 0.1 and 0.2. And a so-called well-calibrated model is one in which if we predict it to have 10% probability of having a, um, a, like 3G or some event, we should observe that you know, 1 out of 10 of those actually has the event. And so what we want is we want like these dots to line up perfectly on the 45 degree line. And OK, so it's not perfect. So we're kind of like under calibrated initially, and then we're over calibrated. But this is about as good as like a model as I've ever built. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this looks OK. It doesn't look, it doesn't look like too bad. Yeah, it kind of goes up, sinusoidal. I don't know. Mine, mine tend to look like that. But it doesn't look like totally whack, right? That's also a technical term. So. <laughs> now, of course, we want to do some uh, out of sample accuracy plots. So this is in the test sample. Like when you first do an ROC plot like this, you're like, well, I obviously overfit something. <laughs> but, but this is in the test set, so I don't know what's happening. This is better than any model I've ever built. I don't know what's going on. Um, maybe there was some type of information leak between the test and training set, right? It looks like that, but it's not. I promise you. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I, mean, I don't know. It's a really, it's, maybe it's a very easy prediction problem because the area under the curve is, is super high. Um, but when you look at something like this, you're like, wow, this is really overfit. But, but it's not. This is in the test set. So, so good on me. <laughs> not bad. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. All right, so that's all the machine learning stuff. We're going to embed this machine learning technology within an event study. And the event study is going to measure what is the probability of an accident right when we get access to, a, uh, to 3G technology on that road. We're going to do a fixed effect Poisson model. Poisson model, we're going to use that as opposed to a regression because it's a count data problem. You can't have fractions of accidents. You can't have negative accidents. And so we're going to estimate this model. The coefficient of interest here is just theta. That's just going to measure what happens before and what happens after the timing of the introduction of, of 3G. Like, so once this road gets access, we're going to line up all the roads right when they get access to 3G and figure out what happens before and what happens after. And you might say that some roads just are more dangerous. So we're going to control for the average road traffic. And we're actually going to have road fixed effects. So that if one road is just like, you know, also janky or like has some sort of like, just, just has like a higher probability of accidents, we're going to control for that. And we're going to control time fixed effects. So maybe in December, there's more accidents for whatever reason. 
All right, so let's look. So let's see whether actually like getting access to mobile-enabled cell phones cause more accidents. The suspense. OK, so we're plotting the probability of an accident on the y-axis. And the, on the x-axis, we're plotting the years relative to that change, whether you, whether you get uh, 3G access or not. And so it looks at you know, pretty much a, you know, two years after getting access to 3G, um, remember this 3G is predicted, looks like we have an increase in probability of accidents. And then three or four years out, we get a much greater increase in probability of accidents. And we can do this heterogeneous based on the age of the driver, because we actually know a lot of information on accidents. So it looks like, not surprisingly, younger drivers are more susceptible to looking at their phones when they should be driving. So this first plot up here to the left is, is for accidents for people 29 and younger. See, like, much inc greater increase in probability of accident. And, but pretty much, you know, the people between 30 and 40 and 50 and 64 also are tempted by using their cell phones. So they also have like a higher propensity of getting in traffic accidents following um, this road having, having 3G access. It's only the people who are 65 and older that have no, no temptation whatsoever. <laughs> so these people are, not, people are not tempted by looking at their phones. So, so sorry, sorry, mom and dad. You guys, are, you guys are in bad luck. All right, so to conclude, um, we see that accident rates increase by 1.1% when a road gets access to 3G coverage. Um, and internet, this is, so if you look at this in aggregate, it looks like internet connected mobile phones cause over 3,000 accidents in California, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, and I think one thing that's really cool is this is just further evidence that you can embed machine learning predictions within a causal model, right? People often say that, oh, machine learning is only for prediction. That's all you can do. But no, no, this is causal. We've just embedded it within um, a causal model here. OK. All right, so comment suggestions, please, uh, please email me. I'm always happy to talk about this. If you want to sponsor my research wanna, or you want to make me aware of any grants, I would love to talk to you. Um, and like I said, we're, we're, we're always expanding in you know, the number of classes that we're offering. So if you happen to be in the Southern California area and you want to teach a class, like I, like I handle a lot of the curriculum there. So I'd love to talk to you about that. So I know we're, all, we're always hiring like full-time, non-tenure track people. So if you want to talk about teaching a class there, we'd love to have you. Um, OK. All right. Thanks.